I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to this uh, special edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be here. Uh, as always, holding it down only, of course, until the Remix Morning Show and its full crew reconvenes tomorrow morning for our Monday morning, Tuesday mornings at 8 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> All right. Uh, all the normal stuff and some other things that I would normally want to get into, I'm going to hold off on for right now. Uh, our time is slightly limited and our guest is incredibly special uh, and I want to maximize our time with her uh, for her full bio and more, which isn't really a full bio. You can check the show notes in the description to this uh, video here. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Joy James, who, among many, many, many other things, is a senior research fellow at the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, where she is curator of the digital repositories, the Warfield and Harriet Tubman Library Circle, an educational nonprofit organization. Uh, she is also professor of Africana Studies at Williams. So I think I'm misreading something there, but we'll get that straight. But and I just want to say before we get I don't know why. Anyway, I, we'll get that straight. But 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 uh, uh, but among these many other things, I just want to also say Dr. James, who has written so many incredible things and said and offered so many incredible and important ways to interpret and analyze the world, is one of those, I think, unfortunately, two rare figures within the academic world who does in so many ways maximize her relationships with the university with the community, helping junior and other faculty and other scholars. She is an amazing person in that capacity as well, a true guerrilla intellectual. And I am very honored to have her back with us again this morning. Uh, Dr. James, good morning. Thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, okay. Appreciate you. Morning, Jerry. And why am I reading a bio, a, a wrong bio it's here? I mean, but it's the old one and- The um, old one. It's like seven years old, but I can't get the college to scrub it. I don't know. Yeah, because I, mean, I got it off the I got it off the Williams web. Well, yeah, I don't think I'm a high priority for them, right? It's like, well, maybe seven years from now we'll actually update your bio. But um, I appreciate you, the work. I mean, Black Power Media, the music. This was great. Wake up morning music. It was shout a out to May. Shout out to Sister May. Sister May, thank you. She does. That's that's as much as I'm, uh, I, I think, authorized to say about her uh, in, in, in public praise. So well, I appreciate I mean, it's the culture <laughs> right, that keeps it going. So I appreciate absolutely. It. Um, I, there's so many things that we can and I and I uh, uh, hope to in some way or if, if not today in future discussions get to. But I did want us to start with uh, this new piece that you published for Verso, New Bones, Abolitionism, Communism and Captive Maternals. Uh, again, the link to that is also in the uh, show notes uh, or description to this video. Um, but could you talk a little bit about that and maybe as you start in the piece, tell us uh, what New Bones is is referring to uh, coming from poet Lucille Clifton. Yeah, a beautiful poet um, whose ancestor now, I believe. So Verso asked me to write up something based on a talk I gave on a panel with Cherise Burden Stelly, your colleague, comrade, right? Shout out Dr. CBS, yes, indeed. Silvia Federici, um, a feminist scholar, philosopher, and, and others. I'm sorry, I don't remember everyone's name. Um, but anyway, this was weeks ago at UC Davis. And when they reached out, they were like, we have the last of this money. We want to put this together. And we're going to talk about communism. And I'm grateful, Jared, to your school, 
I would call it a school. Yeah. Your show is like a learning school, a freedom school, because that's where I got to hear Frank Chapman talk about his book, right? Mm. About perspectives, um, Marxist Leninist perspectives rather on black liberation. So I took what I learned from the community, U.S. community, um, Cabral, you know, a Panther decades ago introduced me to the writings of Milkar Cabral, the freedom fighter, the African freedom fighter for Guinea-Bissau and the Cape Verde Islands, who was unfortunately, you know, this is the tragedy and, and the terror and the fierce beauty of our legacy, right? Assassinated, allegedly, you know, the, United States, NATO, and Britain were helping Portugal hold on to its last colony, right? So the Portuguese, if you read Eric Williams or Walter Rodney, the great Walter Rodney, um, beloved, also assassinated in 1980, right? Um, enslavement of Africans jump-started, right? The accumulation process known as capitalism or imperialism as we know it today. And so Cabral and his resistance to that obviously would be fighting the Europeans. Like Portugal was the first like to build their national economy through enslavement of Africans and the last to want to give up their colonies. So this fierce fight, and Cabral is traveling to the U.S., talking to black audiences in the U.S., this fierce fight um, created a whole world of analyses and culture and spirit and resistance. And once he was killed, academics and intellectuals, like guerrilla intellectuals, collected the speeches and they printed Return to the Source, which is a document you can find online. So then again, backtracking or going full circle, um, someone I knew in the Panther Party who was a friend told me to read this text. I read it, I taught it this back, um, past semester in my class on Black Marxism. It really spoke to me and I think some of the students. So when I was giving the talk at UC Davis, it wasn't just Lucille Clifton's New Bones. It was also Cabral's return to the source, which is the people in struggle, not the elites, right? But the mass base, because that's the source of culture and it's the source of resistance. So the New Bones that Lucille Clifton beautifully writes about in her poem are the framework for our movements. And <clears throat> excuse me, those bones do not come from the academy because the mm. you know, academics, whatever you and I do is our side um, commitments. <laughs> the side hustle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, our side hustle. The deans aren't paying us, you know, they pay us to do something else. Right? You can follow <laughs> orders and then we like do what we can. But the new bones come from the people who struggle for dignity, honor, and to feed their kids and to care for their elders and the ill and the ailing. And so Cabral, Lucille Clifton um, opened the doors for me to look at our industry, which is academia, mm -hmm. and to look at the claims of not only our industry, but nonprofit industries, um, assertions that they're offering new bones, like a skeletal framework that can actually hold up a freedom, a body of freedom movements. And I, in the verso, article which was built on the talk i argue differently why why do you think it's important i thought it stood out a little bit in your first uh, line you write uh, black poet educator and parent lucille clifton's new bones shaped skeletal reflections on revolutionary anniversaries and i'm just wondering why you thought it was important to to include that she's a parent well you know your bio you say your father and you're a partner, a husband, right? I mean, I see the new bones formation is tied to love. And so the, the you know, I don't wanna do the, the cliche, the personal is political, but like the reality is our learning how to love happens in small spaces of intimacy. Betrayals of love happen in those zones as well. Mm. Our ability to love our communities and to love freedom, not just as an abstraction that we can't force an empire to materialize, you know, so that we can actually live free, right? But on all these levels, the relationships are key. And so when I end that article, I talk about the captive maternal, and I've written about it in the womb of Western theory. Uh, you know, I think that piece came out in 2015. But to be a parent, you know, and it's not gendered, right? Again, it's function. 
to yeah. actually be a parent now as a noun or title, but to be a parent or to parent as a verb is a relationship of sacrifice, determination, and struggle, particularly if we're black, because <clears throat> the state as, you know, what is it, parents, parents, patriae, like I can't speak Latin, but anyway, the state asserts its patriarchal authority over us and over our children. And so its capacity to punish us, to deny us autonomy, right? to deny us maroon sides, to deny us, you know, basic human rights that Malcolm like walked over to the UN in 63, just as civil rights Congress did it in 1951. Those are, that's the authority of the predatory parental structure. Lucille Clifton is the opposite. And I, I mentioned also like further down the article when I talk about Cabral, I note that Cabral's apparent also. So the future are the generations coming forward um, to the extent that 20 something year olds are saying, write another stage of the captive maternal and make it about betrayal. Then that means that organizations or movements or movement leaders who want to function in sort of a parental authority that's benign have obviously not been able to deliver if so many of the youth feel that they've been misinformed about their own liberation movements and the possibilities of reform that actually deliver. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I am uh, skipping around just a little bit here, but just to, to somewhat bookend your point, you write uh, um, as an ungendered function, the captive maternal emanates out of the mutations of chattel slavery. The captive maternal is linked not only to the routine theft of generative powers of the enslaved, but also to the inevitable sporadic organized revolts against captivity. Uh, so uh, just to flip back sort of to the beginning, uh, you talk about um, uh, what you describe them uh, I mean, many interesting ways that you write, I think very uh, powerful ways that you write, you know, you refer to uh, rebel trauma milestones, uh, right. these anniversaries of, of Attica and George Jackson's assassination. Um, uh, 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 Tulsa, uh, the civil Tulsa rights. Tulsa and so on, civil rights, sorry, yeah, and, and so on. So, you know, uh, um, you know, could we talk a little bit about what these, these, uh, rebel trauma milestones uh, mean and why you um, or how you you mean to work these uh, anniversaries into this piece here. Right. So we're 2021, right? It's like I have to check. Mm -hmm. um, I start with the article noting the Paris Commune, which, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's there, so technically we as African people weren't there. But when Marx, and that's why there is a Marxist element into this piece, and others noted, and also Du Bois mm. um, wrote about abolitionism and communism, I, I believe, in um, the late 1880s, right? So we're all exploring these possibilities of what a communal life looks like outside of capitalism that was built literally on the bones of Black people enslaved. So 1871, you have the Paris Commune. Right. And it registers because it's the same time as Reconstruction era, you know, and the betrayals that will follow from there. So in the Paris Commune, they're trying to take down the state. Right. In order to feed themselves as workers, as poor people and not to be sent off to these imperial wars. I mean, you know, this is a mirror reflection of the of the U.S. Right. Vietnam, I mean, we could go through the list, you know, AFRICOM, whatever the hell they're doing right now, devastating um, continents. The Middle East, thank you, Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, they are not captive maternals. I'll, I can mm. say more about the captive maternal as a nurturer supporter, as opposed to an opportunist later, right? But 1871, Paris Commune, we've got um, Tulsa, we've got the Civil Rights Congress, writing, putting together We Charge Genocide, the crimes against the U.S. Negro uh, by the United States, right? Full title you can find in the document. We've got Attica. So those are the key ones that are just historical registers. I don't really talk much about Tulsa, but I'm like, you know, resistance, rebellion, 
the Paris Commune that understood, as Marx did, that slavery jump-started capitalism and capitalism and empire would eat everybody's lunch, just devastate globally except for the uber elites, right? In these resistance moments, right, you see the trauma mutate into rebellion. So, right, George Jackson is killed in August, right, in 1971. My understanding, I'm not a historian, so historians will correct me, but uh, that's California across the country um, in New York, right? The incarcerated know who Jackson is. They know what Soledad brother is as a text. They understand what it means to be captive, but to rebel not just individually, but also to organize. And they also understand the nature of violence, inherently predatory when practiced by the state, but has possibilities if you believe that you have the right to security, safety, and longevity, right? So I said at the conference, you know, that this article came from, that George Jackson was the architect of 20th century abolitionism. But academics have a hard time dealing with that because George Jackson was also a militarist. And from the side of prison, he said that this US was proto-fascist where academics say, no, it's not, which means you can work with it, it reform it, there's liberal possibilities, you know, electoral. And, you know, I vote too. So I'm not saying I'm without critiques and contradictions within myself. I'm just noting these distinctions, right? So when I think, let's just focus on Attica, this anniversary. When I think of Attica, I see the captive maternal. I see it in George Jackson. And some people think the captive maternal is a female phenomenon. It's not. And in this way, I differ or depart from conventional black feminism. It's ungendered because it's a function. You care about people. You sacrifice for people, you struggle in movements, even when people are throwing rotten produce at you and calling you out a name, but you continue to be disciplined to struggle. That is a captive maternal, but there are contradictions in different stages. So if you believe that George Jackson lived and died to be free, not just for himself as an individual, but for the collective, the community, understood black internationalist struggle, right? then his assassination will have a personal impact on you. And that was true of the people inside of Attica. So what started probably as a small protest among the most politicized, as we know, expanded. And this is when I end the article, I start talking about these different stages of expansion of the growth of new bones among captive maternals. I use Attica because it's a male prison even though I argue everybody who was sent there probably did not identify as male. If they saw themselves as trans or non-binary, whatever, they're gonna be classified by the state. So I talk about these stages. The first stage is that of the conflicted, or you could be celebratory caretaker. And that means that the incarcerated reproduce the stability of the prison by being the trustees, by cleaning, mm -hmm. by gardening, by cooking, by even giving emotional care for each other to keep people relatively intact in a war zone, which is what prisons are, right? Um, Orisami Burden is doing a book on Attica. I believe he's a historian. I believe the book is, is gonna be quite impressive in its contributions. But in talks that I've heard him given, he talks about how the incarcerated would sing to each other. So that's, like I said, your music, right? Miss May, like it's 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 soothing to the soul when you're in stress and struggle, right? That's the first level. The prison could not exist without the incarcerated maintaining it. But that was the nature of enslavement writ large for all of us, that we would stabilize the plantation in order to feed our own people, right? And in the process, we're stabilizing the entire structure of the plantation, right? The second stage is the protest stage when, you know, the Attica folks say, we're humans, we deserve rights, we want dignity, and they start to mobilize. 
The third stage, right, is the movement stage where you go from a protest to an organizational struggle, right? And from that movement stage, you can move to Maranage, where when they took over the prison, they built a maroon camp inside the prison walls. They had, you know, food delivery system, waste removal system, medic system, political education, who would talk to the New York Times and the press, who would issue the call for Bobby Seale or some folks to come visit, you know, who would talk to counselor, the attorney, et cetera, et cetera. But that level of maranage and autonomy is seen by the state, even though the generative, you know, catalyst is for human rights as a declaration of war. So what does Nelson Rockefeller do after conferring with President Richard Nixon? He calls in the National Guard. And this is the era of, you know, Vietnam, you know, anti-war against Vietnam sovereignty. So you take the military arsenal from foreign wars, you domesticate it by bringing it to the National Guard, which is all white, and they shoot through white prison guard hostages to kill largely black rebels. And in the retaking of the prison, they continue to torture and allegedly execute the rebels. So they're no longer prisoners, right? Even though they're captives. They're captive maternals who are using the language that y'all use, community defenders and community builders. I mean, their crime is not just to want to leave the walls into freedom because they didn't say we want our sentences necessarily shortened. Their crime was to claim a humanity that the state had to respect. And that was the declaration of war, to claim a humanity that your predatory structures, your predator had to respect. So this is the way I see the captive maternal moving through these various stages. The 20 year olds asked me, what's that last stage of betrayal? And the way I close out the piece is to talk about a conference at an elite institution. Well, I, you know, I wrote in the piece, so I can name it, right? So it's Princeton and 2021, 2011, sorry, 2011. So over a decade ago, where I'm asked to speak on, on the girl, right? on the island, right? And first I'm like a little, is this a play? Cause when I start giving the talk, like the New Jersey troopers walk in the door and I was like, did y'all just bring me? Cause you didn't want to do this. Like, I'm going to like, I have to look mm. at these people, right? But that was like, that's my own personal issues. Right? Like I worked through, but here's the thing that happened with the sister sitting in the front row on the panel. When I was talking about Suni Yada Coley's article, right on, on, legal concepts, political imprisonment, and a path forward to freeing political prisoners, but also comprehending the state's um, violent policy against any agency. So the political prisoner can be innocent, they can be you know, a combatant, they could be a pacifist, it doesn't matter. It's the point of rebellion that has to be suppressed, right? And violently. So when I'm on my panel, like, channeling the political prisoners, talking about, you know, COINTELPRO, et cetera, et cetera. I'm probably the only one doing it best to my memory. But the sister in the audience raises her hand in a Q&A and says, hey, I teach at a vocational college, a two-year, right? So where my teaching load is 2-2 and I'm compensated and like I can be middle class with what I'm paid, right? I'm pretty sure she's underpaid or gets a fraction of what everybody who's presenting is paid. Because she says everybody throughout this whole conference on stage comes from an elite university and it's multiracial. It's white, it's you know, it's all the colors of that, right? But all the class is the same. The class standing is the same. And she like just drove the point home, like quietly, like I'm not, you know, raising y'all, but let me just point out a contradiction here. My students, are the ones who are stalked by predatory policing, by poverty, by dishonor. Everything that you're talking about happens to my students, right? Who then, when they come to class, she's the captive maternal looking after them. Or when they disappear, you have to go find them. What happened? Oh, are you at Rikers? Or did somebody, your mom got, what happened to her? You know, it's like constant care, right? 
but without the parental authority to do it. It's just out of love and will. And so she's like, why isn't ever at these elite conferences somebody like me on stage? And so I write in the article, I said, you're absolutely right, but it's not just Princeton. Like if you look across the country, whoever George was, right? To be the catalyst, the tripwire to think about abolitionism in a certain way in 20th century by the time of his death in 1971. Like a generation later in, you know, 1990s, early, you know, turn of the century stuff, he's largely disappeared or marginalized. And so academics become the defining narrators of what abolitionism is. And so they hold the microphone. And so whatever little bit I could say, like, you're right, it's not just here, it's like, you know, it's, it's national, right? This is the prototype. Whoever engineered this started with the elite schools, kept rolling through it, and the publications tend to generate from the sites where there's more leisure to write and publish because you're not teaching for for load, right? Um, and our students are shielded from the predatory violence of police because they're in a private club university or research one university that you know has some modicum of agreement with the cops, how you get to roll against the students enrolled you know, in their infrastructure, right? Or in their structure. So whatever I said could not, was not supported by anybody else. And then there was a counter, um, very prominent person who just basically told her to be quiet because she was insufficiently appreciative of a conference that, you know, probably cost tens of thousands of dollars, you know, and had a, a really nice dinner that I went to as well and drank wine <laughs> at the end. So. This is, this is the, you know, the new bones, right? This is why I finally sat down and tried to write this piece for Verso. The new bones are essential if we're going to be able to mobilize. But the new bones would not come from infrastructure that the mass of Black people do not control. The mass of Black people do not control the Ivy League. And the mass of Black people do not control Research One institutions, which are actually entities that are governmental. I mean, UT Austin, UC, those are government. We don't control the government and we don't control wealth like that, okay? So we don't control ideology that comes from those sites. So the new, we would have to talk to the people like that sister who actually has the experiences of what abolitionist struggle means on the ground and in the community. So there's a lot going on in that essay, but. Essentially, that's where I was trying to get to. There is, there is uh, uh, a lot going, like going on. on. Um, um, let me, let me, I'm going to just mute your mic because I think I'm getting some feedback. What, so just while I ask this this uh, next question and attempt to segue here, because just for the sake of time, uh, and I will invite people again to click the link uh, uh, and read uh, Dr. James's uh, essay here. It is, um, there is a lot going on. But to segue to something that that uh, um, you've been working on for a while, uh, I'm happy and honored to be working with you in some supportive capacity uh, for this June 12th summit. You you uh, you sort of it seems to me at least when I'm reading the piece here uh, uh, provide at least a segue to sort of point us in the direction for what that summit. Uh, is meant to do and what you're, you and, and others who are putting it together are intending for it to do. And you say here in this piece for Verso, uh, when hegemonic leaders in our government market themselves as the source of new bones for social justice, their popularity is often leveraged, but rarely by the masses. Rather, mass media, political parties, and nonprofit industries invest in managing resistance to elite dominated political economic orders by raising a favorable profile visibility of their desirable leaders. Black feminist leadership has been celebrated for delivering an electoral victory. Black men were the second largest voting demographic for the Biden Harris administration. Thus, black people were key to defeating President Donald Trump. Still, hegemonic black leadership elevated during the Obama administration has not developed and delivered a system for working and, la and laboring classes to elect and remove liberation leaders based on their lack of accountability to under-resourced communities. I, I, reading that, and even though I'm, 
again in this this deep you know on the side watching you put this together role for the summit i even in that i don't recall ever thinking of of in all these years what you've just written at least not in the way you've written it here this this idea that this, that there needs to be a developed and delivered system for working and laboring classes to elect and remove liberation leaders so uh as a segue to to maybe talk about the summit could you Sure. Um, <laughs> I want to make it clear. I'm not a. I'm not a liberation leader. I'm not trying to be a liberation leader. Um, I see my role as one in solidarity. I already said I was middle class, right? So, yeah, all your like suspicions of the petty bourgeoisie. I spent a, a, quite a bit of time in that article quoting Kathleen Cleaver, right? Mm -hmm and her critique of the black petty bourgeoisie and the black middle class. And again, the concept of betrayal, like if they're not anti-imperialist as a core, and we're, I mean, we might be more into consumer society than figuring out like why is a coup bad in the United States, but okay in Haiti, according to the Biden-Harris, right, hmm. administration. Um, but as, while not being a liberation leader, then I say, I don't grow new bugs. But I will state that after 37 years of organizing in solidarity, I can recognize new bugs when I see them. And I can recognize simulacra or the fake stuff, right? Like the replacement stuff that is not like, yo man, you can't even like stand up with that because it's gonna, you're gonna fall because those, they're not even connected. What did you make that out of toothpicks? You know, I'm not trying to be snarky, but that's not, mm -mm, it's not going to work. So when I think about the mechanisms of democracy being absolutely essential, we're told, for stability, but also going forward, then the question comes, so how come, like, if you, if you get millions, hundreds of millions of dollars or, or more, how come you're not getting paid to create those mechanisms of democratic control from the base. If you hate the electoral college and you understand like, you know, every time Sally Hemings had a baby, you know, rape, you know, product by Thomas Jefferson or, you know, three fifth clause of enslaved people, how Southern presidents came about disproportionately because three fifth put two black people together and you get representational power, et cetera, et cetera. So if you understand that electoral college tells you we don't have a direct democracy, if you understand the role of voter suppression, if you understand the role of Citizens United for unlimited, you know, almost private donor wealth flooding into these organizations or movements or elections to skew them towards elites and white nationalists, right? Then a security apparatus for black people would be that we have capacity to check those people who are paid to speak for us, right? So if you're saving US democracy, then bring those democratic practices to black communities so that they can say, well, we appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we appreciate you for your service in 2014, 2015, but by 2017, it looks like this is an accumulation scheme and we need you to step down. That doesn't, there's no mechanism. You, there's no, it's like people went up the ladder and then they saw the, all the rungs off, right? Like you can't climb, you don't, they don't even return your calls. Like the part of this summit came because some 20 some year old activists who raised tens of thousands of dollars to support, you know, unhoused, you know, families that were impacted like reached out to me and I met with them briefly and then it was clear, well, our politics organizing one thing, impacted people have their own needs. And so the summit is gonna be separate, but the understanding was that there is an accumulation process. This is what we agreed on, right? And then again, as I write in the article, accountability gets really fuzzy if you don't set boundaries before you start organizing with each other, right? Um, but it became really clear that when we were asking for a collective meeting, 
the people who've made considerable wealth and have reached the stature of political celebrity didn't have to meet because there's no, there's no mechanism to make them meet with you. And even if you get the list of the last distribution of the last of the monies or some of the monies, nobody knows because it's not fully transparent. You don't know which organization got which amount. And as I talk to black activists from New York City who have been in some of these organizations that have been compensated, I know I feel that that verb is probably not appropriate, but they've been paid, right? They raise the question, how come these organizations never organize unions inside of their nonprofit matrix? Like, wait, and I'm like, wait, time out. You mean like this is a freedom movement organization and the people who work there do not have collective bargaining power so that they can take on the hierarchy in their own organization that's supposed to free everybody else and the world? Like y'all didn't even put basic union rights inside of your freedom movement that's paid by finance capital. Oh, if it's paid by finance capital, why would you even know? Because that's not what they're paying you for. So when you know these contradictions start unfolding, the, you know not only is there no new bone growth, but when people break the bones of people, you know, kettled in the Bronx by the NYPD, when they um, damage and fracture the frameworks of people doing peaceful protests or not peaceful protests, when they do black identity extremist harassment stuff, it would be really nice if you knew how to make a call to the people who have the money for black freedom and to issue a list of needs and demands and to be able to hold them accountable if they do not follow through on community needs and demands. That mechanism was never built to my knowledge. And I hope somebody proves me wrong and says, yeah, well, here's the number, 1-800-da-da-da-da-da, and we can get you bail funds, or 1-800-da-da-da-da, and we can find a building for housing for unhoused black trans youth, right? But I haven't heard from the activists that they have access to the powerful who are speaking in the name of whole communities who don't even know them and cannot control them. So I always think, I know like just to back up, when the college pays me what they're paying me for, X number of classes, show up for office hours, you know, basically one, two, three, ABC. Well, if you have movement leaders what are you being paid for? Because the, the mass isn't paying your salary, your bills, or for your lifestyle. So who's paying you and why, and what are their expectations, right? What are you supposed to deliver for that money? And it, we cannot control the money flow. We can't turn it off. We're not unionized within these sectors, if that's the case, as I've been told. So this is like a runaway train of accumulation and also simulacra. It's not real black power, it's simulacra power. Here's, you know, what is real black power? New bones with struggle. What is fake power? A lot of money and a lot of platforms. So the summit is not about me, I'm just moderating with you. And there are eight speakers, right? People who've been in Black Lives Matter, well, here, thanks. There, there they are, right there. <laughs> These are the people who will be speaking. They're the activists. Some of them have nothing to do with BLM, um, you know, Abolish Slavery National Network. Um, the Sherpearl Wells and Dorothy Holmes are, you know, brilliant, dedicated mothers that I've known for over five years. Um, very appreciative of their work. Daruba bin Mohad, we know as a theorist. And there's Ashley Yates, Bianca Jamar, Felix Crittenton, sorry if I messed up your name, BLM 10 plus. So it's a combination of the folks that the younger generation knew, a combination of me from an older generation of folks that I knew, and the dominant, <clears throat> sorry, the dominant voices will come from these folks 
We hope to build an archive from this, which is to collect data, narratives, emails, analyses, including from the Black Anonymous crew that wrote this brilliant statement, taking it back to 1963, March on Washington, and Malcolm X's critique of the Big Six. Like, you know, the Kennedy administration organized a performance piece and told people, don't get too radical, which means, I guess today, don't get too black, right? And essentially, it's like, and we will pay you to do what we tell you to do, or we will cut the cord on the mic. And so the Black activists are from the Black Anonymous wrote this brilliant piece, which I hope to, you know, you'll see fairly soon this week, which they go from 1963 and they bring it up to the disappearance of Ferguson activists whose names people don't recall. And also the origin of the term Black Lives Matter. They say, no, it actually came from this individual, <coughs> I believe a black male academic. And so our culture is generative. Our struggles are complicated, contradictory, but when they're driven by love, they do take us to the brink of changing the material reality of struggle. And of course, repression follows, so we regroup, but also funders follow. And what the summit is trying to do to the best of its capacity based on these eight speakers is reveal what we need to know and figure out collective strategies for going forward. Right on. Uh, thank you very much for that. And again, that, that summit's going to be here on uh, BPM uh, on June 12th. That's Saturday, this Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, please do uh, come on through. Um, very quickly, just the thing on Attica, there's always something that sticks out to me on this that I meant to ask you or bring up just to, just to say that, that I always think about with the, with the, or am reminded of when, when, uh, uh, Attica, uh, is mentioned, um, that it was reported that the white prison guards who were held captive were told by their bosses that they would not be paid for the hours where they would not have been normally considered to be working though they were being held hostage. So in other words, from like midnight to 8 a.m., they weren't given, they weren't paid because, so I just always, I, I, for some reason of all the horrors that occurred, that that, <laughs> that story just says so much about everything. Like they wouldn't even pay the, like, your own people got, <laughs> and you're telling them, well, from 12 to eight, you weren't really, you would have been sleeping. So we're not going to pay you for that. It's like, what? Yeah. Anyway. anyway. No, so. but it is, yeah. Um, yeah, this is, <laughs> I know like, oh, we got words. But when I first, you know, the Eyes on the Prize documentary, right? Mm -hmm. Law part two. So that's the one. It opens with, was it, is it George's assassination? Honestly, I don't remember, but. Um, okay. I remember. Yeah. So number of things going on in it. Um, I believe, you know, Fred Hampton, 69, you know, to George, 71, Attica, 71, right? George dies in August. The Attica Rebellion happens in September. It's when I show the footage of the black, the black and white footage, right, to my students, which I've done for years. But the first time I saw it, which was decades ago, it was shocking because there is a white prison guard who basically talks about being shot, I believe, four times. Mm. And even though Rockefeller spins it that the incarcerated were murderous, and yeah, you know, there were some people in for such crimes, right? But the rebellion and two trustees, I believe, died in the original takeover, right? Um, they had no guns. And finally, the truth came out. Everybody who died by gunshot was killed by white National Guard. And then I was like, oh, you, and this is what I wrote in the piece. And then I had to grapple with it decades, and I guess I'm still processing. You will shoot through white people in order to kill black rebellion, which means white people are totally expendable, mm. right? Whether or not they know it. <laughs> You know, they're like totally expendable, which, you know, this, the whole Marxism mm. thing explains it within, you know, labor exploitation, you know, slave wages, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, look, the state has so much anti-black animus. 
that even it constructs whiteness as sort of like the, you know, holy, right? They will burn it up in order to get to black rebels. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you have to be killed, but I need to get to that black person like who's trying to start a maroon colony, right? And so they're a byproduct an expendable byproduct or detritus or just like leftovers <laughs> if you need to take out a black revolutionary. Yeah. And so mm. I don't I don't think our language, the political language that's the most common can process that. I mean, Sh Cheryl Harris wrote that brilliant um, piece, right, on, you know, what was it? Um, existential whiteness or the property of whiteness or something. I can't re remember the title, right? But it's, you know, it's about you accumulation through, you know, through whiteness. It's just like an existential wealth. You know, Cornel West has talked about that, et cetera, et cetera, right? But that wealth dissipates if black resistance appears on the horizon. Your whole investment portfolio will just go up and smoke. <laughs> and so... Maybe it's a good time not to invest in that, right? Mm. With you can't get the Senate to agree on a commission on January 6th. So, yesterday there was this like really amazing forum, uh, Black Feminist Futures, you know, Paris Harris, others, uh, C. Riley um, Snorton, Norton, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I name, mm -hmm. um, Sadia Hartman, um, Savannah. Sange, I'm sorry, you just all forgive me, okay? It's just like, I've been working overtime, my brain is like expiring. But we had like this whole discussion back and forth. In part, like I think about what is black feminism, or like who are we constituted as in opposition to whiteness or how do white imperialism and capitalism constitute us through anti-blackness, right? And the only thing I can remember among all the different things that we were talking about is like, I got some clarity that my commitment is not to the intramural per se. My commitment is to the source. And the source is whatever is generative for resistance. The whole collection of black people do not agree ideologically on politics. There are people who want to work for government. There are people who want to work for empire. There are people who want to work for capital. I'm not here to persuade them to do otherwise, right? I'm not here to persuade people of color or white people to do A, B, C, one, two, three, or anything like that. I am simply a seeker for the source, which comes from our cultures of resistance. So whatever the intramural is doing, like throwing like broken glass at Afro pessimism instead of paying attention to Brazil or Colombia, <laughs> black masses, around. whatever, in, you know, inner, whatever, Nissan, whatever y'all are throwing down. Don't, it's not of interest. It's, this is my position on the captive maternal. The state stole and repurposed our generative powers to care for each other in order to accumulate through a regime of terror. That is what slavery is. It is a crime against humanity. As Cabral says, we can take it to the UN as the Civil Rights Congress did, Malcolm did, and Cabral did in the 1970s. But he later says, which I quote in the article, we were a bit naive, right? Because the international community, especially that building and really wealthy real estate in Manhattan, they like their lifestyle. Right. In fact, if I can interrupt you, because you wrote this so I, I, powerfully, you yeah. said Cabral asserted that he did not appear before the U.N. committee, quote, in order to obtain more violent condemnations and resolutions against the Portuguese colon colonialists. He came for material aid. He left empty handed. Yeah. I and wanted... No, I mean, for me, this is why Cabral is the source. When I say I'm a seeker, I'm learning. I'm trying to learn. I'm not trying to proselytize. I'm trying to learn. And then when I write, I share with people everything I learn from the source. Almost all my books, like Eight Years Anthologizing Political Prisoners, Transcending the Talented Tenth, Charlene Mitchell, Black Communist who created Che Lumumba Club, recruited Angela into it. She's the one who told me to go to Schomburg and read all the memoirs of Du Bois, look at the contradictions of the Talented Tenth. 
everything I wrote, like my dissertations on Hannah Arendt, a liberal German Jewish philosopher, right, and Khan. It has nothing to do about this struggle. Everything I write is about struggle because I'm a learner, a seeker, and I learn from the source. And so what Cabral says about the UN applies today. But I, I suggest at the end of the article, right, that if the academy is acting like the UN, like with these mission statements, but no material support for freedom fighters on the ground, then it's a form of betrayal, just like the UN does. Right? I mean, it says all the right friggin' things. And then when things jump off, you can go to it. You know, remember Che Guevara went there and condemned the UN, right? After Patrice Lumumba was assassinated. And he says, y'all keep talking about peaceful coexistence, which the Soviets were, you know, promoting, I think in part because they didn't want the US to nuke them or something. But then the third world becomes the war zone for everybody else. I mean, that's where you do your assassinations, your coups, et cetera, et cetera. And so when Che Guevara goes and he's like, we are happy to have peaceful coexistence if y'all would stop killing us. And this is what I was saying at the Black Feminist Conference. You know, I'm happy to have therapeutic meetings with everybody and anybody if you will agree to stop killing us. So far, you haven't agreed to those terms. So like you have the right-wing terrorists underground that just came, that's above ground now, you have them being under-policed. You have Black activists being harassed. You have internal conflict, right? And if this international community or academic community are supposed to be objective arbiters of struggle, that's not the function they're actually playing. You will leave empty-handed. They are not committed to the source. And you can't control them. We don't pay their salaries, so they're going to do whatever they want to do based on the people who pay their salaries. Does that make struggle impossible? Absolutely not. But we redirect, in my opinion, our energies towards the source of culture that doesn't mystify the violence of empire, but will actually recognize and speak to it in a tangible language. I'm not always clear, and so that's my limitation. It's not the limitation of Cabral. If, you know, if I don't do a, a decent job, read Cabral. I gave you the link in the article. You know, read Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, just go to the friggin' source. That's the best I can say. I'm just an academic, you know, doing support work. Mm. That sounds like an insufficient statement, but I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Um, I uh, and by the way, I just saw the the again the documentary that, that's uh, I, I keep forgetting the title of it, but about Dag Hammarskjöld. Forgive me for mispronouncing. But when you talked about the 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 uh, uh, the, the, the the what was it the, the 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 wealth and existential whiteness was was totally withdrawn from his account as he was trying to bring peace to a rebellious African. Uh, 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 continent, he was messing up the program <laughs> and got his plane shot down. <laughs> so, it was, it just, anyway, so it, when you're talking about Lumumba, because he was he was on his way to try to help broker peace between Lumumba and um, wasn't that when he was get was shot down? I can't remember, but anyway, it was just one of those. It was, it was uh, anyway, yeah, just another was, one of those moments. I'm not saying to romanticize revolutionaries, right. Mm -hmm. But I think that we should take them seriously and not try to commodify, package, or put them in the freezer. Hmm. And if you see the risks that they took, they took the, those risks for a reason. And what they left behind hmm. was legacy, not to replicate their actions, but to study them and figure out how to promote longevity not just the longevity of our individual lives or collective lives, but the longevity of struggle. And yes, I would argue that all revolutionaries are expendable by the state and probably indexed by the state. So the question becomes, what do we who, are, who do not see ourselves as revolutionaries, but do not see us as ourselves as anti-revolutionary, right? What do we owe revolutionaries? What do we owe the people on the front line? 
we obviously owe them something. Like money doesn't flow in until there's a rebellion, but the money goes to the people who <laughs> do the rebellion, right? So if you've achieved some degree of employment or comfort or stature, you know, I'm fine. I'm like not hating. I told you where I work, but there is accountability and there is decency. That's the only word that can come to mind. You can't forget the rebellions. You can't like massage them into some version of liberalism and you can't forget the rebels. And they will come in different shades and forms and they will probably only be a fraction of our communities and populations, but they actually have knowledge. So, you know, if you look at that graphic, we have allies, like that graphic of 500 years of rebellion, of resistance, that came from Asian allies, right? Who like found that graphic. Um, the Lucille Clifton um, poem was sent to me by um, a person I was in seminary with in New York City, you know, a white um, feminist activist who like works against like intimate violence and family violence and stuff like that. So it's a composite, right? But the, the, the heartbeat, yeah, there's the graphic. And if when you open it, you're like, oh, wow, we've been busy for half a millennium, right? So we have allies, we have structure. The point is to amplify the voices who are the most impacted. So the eight people that are listening, I'm sure there's dozens, scores, hundreds more, to archive our knowledge in an accessible place in terms of the contradictions and to meditate on those contradictions, strategize and then move against them in order to strengthen our movements and also strengthen our truth telling. Dr. Joy James, again, I know uh, we gotta keep it a little bit short today, but I uh, just wanna thank you again uh, for all that you are doing and have done and, and continue to do, a lot of which doesn't get attention or is known. I just really appreciate it. And thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, and I want to encourage folks to join uh, you and me and the others again on uh, uh, this weekend, uh, June 12th from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, all of this is at the uh, Black Power Media channel, uh, easily accessible, also at imixwhatilike.org, but but where you'll be able to find the links and, and more, all this information. Uh, and Dr. James, I hope you know we can get you back on again before too long when, when uh, um, you have less meetings to go to and a little more time and you know we can hang out a little more. But thank you very much again. Well, thank you for all the work that y'all and Black Power Media do in keeping us informed and educated. Stay well. All right, likewise, right on. We'll talk to you as soon as possible. Take care. All right, everybody, uh, thank you very much again uh, for this unfortunately uh, slightly abbreviated uh, broadcast. Uh, big thanks to Dr. James, uh, who, I mean, really, she is... <laughs> beyond words remarkable and beyond these platforms and the public uh um uh work uh truly a remarkable person so thanks to her and, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning please do come back tomorrow morning when the remix crew reconvenes at 8 a.m eastern uh and um please check out the uh the great discussion we did yesterday with Two Black of the Black Miss podcast for an additional discussion and a very detailed look uh, and exposure of the myth of the circulating dollar, particularly the black circulating dollar, the circulating black dollar. Uh, please check out the show we did Friday where Kaba and I thoroughly broke down and went through the attendant parallel mythology uh, being uh, promoted by uh, Black commercial media spaces and punditry regarding Black Wall Street, cryptocurrency, buying power, et cetera. Please go check those out if you haven't already and share them. And then please also uh, do as much as you can to uh, like, 
subscribe and join the channel. Uh, the Black Liberation Army conversation we had, Soldier Stories conversations that was previously members only, I think is going to be open to everybody today, if not already. So please go check that out. Uh, and uh, if you can't join and support financially, please at least like, share, subscribe to the channel. All that's free and does help support us. Uh, and uh, come on back uh, tomorrow and in perpetuity and go to the channel and check out everything that you haven't seen or see it again, share it with somebody else. So, uh, and if I didn't get to it today, I do try to get to it afterwards. Uh, so if you're seeing this live or later, uh, and it wasn't addressed, uh, we definitely do want to hear from you and we appreciate you. So as my man, Pierre at comedy hype says, put it in the comments and we'll get to it as as soon as we can. All right everybody, thanks again. Peace everybody if you're willing to fight for it as we know Dr. James is uh and as Fred Hampton used to say, and we'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like live and tomorrow with the Remix Morning Show at uh of course right here at Black Power Media. Peace everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.